and here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Morphology to Framework, Tips and Tricks for Better Results. My name is Sarah and I will be facilitating today. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. First off, this webinar is NBC and CE Broker approved for one, cre one credit. Um, in order to receive the credit, you will need to take a short um, CE test, and you will receive information on that within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we are recording the webinar, so if you'd like to watch it at um, another time, it will be posted to our website within seven days. Finally, if you have any questions at all throughout the webinar, please write them in the questions box located on the right-hand side of your screen. We're going to be answering all questions at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Al Salastri. Al is a certified dental technician who began his training in dental technology shortly after receiving his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Stetson University. Since then, Al has become an accomplished technician in all disciplines within the Crown and Bridge Laboratory. He has presented numerous hands-on courses and clinics in ceramics, composite resins, waxing and metal design, cap tech, capillary casting technology, and many others. In addition, Al has lectured extensively to, to technicians and dentists alike on quality, excellence, communication, and technical skills. He presently owns and operates Clark Dental Laboratory in Lakeland, Florida. Without further ado, I hand it over to Al. Well, thank you, Sarah. That sounds pretty impressive. I, I, I'm impressed with myself, and trust me, I've been doing this probably longer than Dirt's been around. And uh, you know, before to get started, you know, I, I want to thank Whitmix Number One for uh, making this opportunity possible, for sponsoring this webinar, for giving me the opportunity to share some of what what, what we do in my little lab, which is in uh, Lakeland, Florida. And so we're just six technicians. Um, used to be larger, kind of went to this size maybe 10 years ago and enjoy it, you know, work with a limited number of clients. And uh, just so, you know, there that's me in my favorite place, which just happens to be standing in front of a giant redwood up in uh, Yosemite on the way up to Glacier Point, probably uh, my favorite place in the world. And yes, I am a technician, but I do once in a while get away from the bitch and actually get out, which is you know, kind of nice, rare as it might be. Uh, but, you know, as this, was, this lecture was coming together, you know, I, and going through it, it probably maybe should be better called Ideas and Techniques for Better Results. Um, tips and Tricks is maybe a little catchy phrase. But uh, it was kind of daunting. I realized when I was going through this that, you know, defining morphology, finding the key points, uh, what's really important, uh, how to, to, to maybe give this knowledge to somebody was, was, was kind of daunting. And before I get going, though, I'd like to mention that, you know, we're talking about morphology, not necessarily function. So while, uh, you know, these are inevitably intertwined, morphology and function, uh, and, you know, and the knowledge of, of design and movements and articulation of the entire human uh, system is, is really, really important. Today we're going to focus on, only on what I believe to be the most important concepts of posterior morphology and, of course, how to approach doing it. Uh, from from what I am, from from where from where I see it. So we're going to look at the just the basics of posterior morphology: uh, arch form, contour and shape, contacts, tools and methods, common mistakes that I see, uh, and then some tips and tricks. So hopefully we'll have time uh, on achieving early accurate occlusion, warp-free bridges, and, and a few other things. Um, and I wanted to throw in the thing on warp-free bridges just because uh, I think that's something that that really bugs a lot of people when they do longer span castings. But we're looking at basics of posterior arch form, and, and, and some of this I know is going to be reviewed, but you know, I had to start somewhere and go through really what I think are the concepts that are, that are important and lend themselves to really understanding and producing posterior morphology, the curves of Spee and Wilson. Of course, the Spee curve is the concave curve on the, on the uh, on the lower and convex on the upper that is drawn across the cusp tips of the lower posterior teeth, looked at from the buckle. And the Wilson curve is looked at from the distal, you know, or the mesial, and it's a line drawn across the buccal lingual cusp tips, and it defines a, a curve as well. And there are some implications of these curves that, you know, we need to be aware of. Uh, the concavity in the uh, speed curve on the lower defines the lowest or shortest tooth in the arch, which typically occurs somewhere in the middle of the lower first molar. And the convex nature of the upper speed curve defines the longest tooth in the arch, <coughs> pardon me, 
which occurs somewhere between the buccal cuspid of the second bicuspid and the mesial buccal cuspid of the of the upper first molar. Uh, somewhere in that area should be the longest uh, point on, on the arch viewed from the buccal. As far as the Wilson curve goes, this the concave curve of the lower uh, defines the lingual cusp as being shorter than the buccal cusp, which is a sort. That's the first great mistake people make. Typically, when I see carvings and I see posterior teeth, quite often, the lower lingual cusps are just too long, and sometimes you know interfere uh, when we go in in working movements. And then uh, the the convex curve on the upper defines the uh, the lingual cusps of the upper posterior teeth as being longer than the buccal cusps, and and while you know. These are general rules of occlusion and form. Of course, every rule that I mention is meant to be broken. I mean, you know, these things are just general trends uh, that, that occur in nature and something we should be aware of, especially when we're designing ideal occlusion, like when we're waxing up, uh, you know, full arch, upper and lower cases. And so looking at shape, contour, morphology, <coughs> and pardon me, I'm just getting over the flu, so, you know, if I cough a little, I apologize in advance for that. Uh, I want to look at these basics of posterior shape, contour, and morphology. Um, one of the most important concepts, and, and as I was putting this together, you know, I realized that I hadn't really put all these ideas in one place at one time, but heights of contour are interesting. Because when we look at upper and lower molars, uh, we realize that the buccal heights of contour are the same on both uppers and lowers. They're in the, in the gingival one-third of the tooth, one-third of the way up from the tissue. Same is true on the lingual of the upper molars. So upper molars, uh, upper posterior teeth have the height of contour on both sides of the tooth in the same place. The only exception to this rule is the lingual of lower molars and lower bicuspids. They have the height of contour one third of the way down from the occlusal table. That is the one exception. Every other tooth in the posterior arch, upper and lower, has the height of contour down by the tissue. And then something that I see missed a lot in the design of posterior teeth is respecting the interpoxial concavity that occurs on the mesial and distal of these teeth. And um, it's absolutely essential that we respect this to allow room for the papilla and not impinge on the tissue. And so I chose these specific aspects of contour because I see these violated quite often. <laughs> now, I throw this up just to show that bicuspids, all the posterior teeth share the same um, position of heights of contour, all in the gingival one-third of the tooth with the exception of the lingual cusps of all the, all the lower posterior teeth. That's in the um, one-third of the way down from the occlusal table. And this is an important concept, as you'll see later, because it lends itself to other criteria that we need to concentrate on when we're designing all these teeth. And then another area that I usually see, um, I quite often see improperly formed would be the occlusal embrasure area. These areas where the teeth touch are always rounded. Now, posterior teeth form embryologically from lobes. They, they form from the tooth buds are basically rounded um, things that fuse together. And so everything in teeth is rounded, and they're fused together, rounded structures that fuse together. And one of the things I, 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 I tell people a lot when I'm teaching this, I say, think of, of like a ball. I say, I say, you didn't get your tennis ball, okay? Where, where teeth come together, where lobes are, where incisal edges round on interiors, think of it as like having a small ball kind of buried inside this tooth and just part of the outer surface is being exposed. And you have this roundedness that's in all three directions. And it's a subtle rounding of teeth where they come together and where lobes exist that is really, really important for a natural uh, looking morphology. Now, when we start to look at the group of posterior teeth as a whole and start to, to, to dissect the shapes, we realize that there are really only three basic shapes in posterior teeth. There's a square shape, a rhomboid shape, and a trapezoid shape. And we look at the teeth that conform to these shapes, and there's three squares on the bottom, which are the uh, two molars of the second bicuspid on the lower. There are two rhomboids on the upper, which are the two molars on the upper, and the rest of the posterior teeth are trapezoid in shape, the upper two bicuspids and only the lower first bicuspid. Now, this is a really important concept to have because it defines other very important things because the buccal and lingual embrasure form 
as well as the proximal contact placement between teeth is all a function of this shape. And because the shape of these teeth when they touch each other, it, it places the contact areas where trapezoids touch each other or touch squares or rhomboids in the buccal one-third of the tooth. And it has to be this way because of the nature of the shape of these teeth. So if we shape our teeth right, these things naturally happen. And it also defines the buccal lingual embrasures. <coughs> Excuse me. Where uh, when these trapezoid shapes touch each other, uh, it creates um, a lingual embrasure that's two to three times the size of the buccal embrasure. And the same is true where trapezoids or squares touch each other. It places the contact point in the middle of the tooth and it creates embrasures that are roughly the same size, buccal lingually. So it changes as the tooth shape changes how these embrasures and contact areas are positioned and are formed and the size of them. And of course, the same is also true for the lower. So when we start looking at how we begin to implement these things and carve teeth, um, to me, one of the most important things you can do is utilize inclined planes whenever you're carving morphology because this lends itself automatically to producing the right kind of form and the right kind of, of heights and depths on a cool surface that not only function well but look nice. And I just throw this in. I don't know if anybody out there has this. I'm pretty sure it's not available. It's the old Williams Gold Tooth Carving Manual and you'll see that I, 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 I'm, I stole these diagrams from this manual. And it's just, it's like the Bible of morphology <coughs> and carving for me. And it's an indispensable tool in, in um, you know, refreshing myself sometimes and also in, in helping train other people. But if we want to look at keys to natural morphology, um, the first thing is deep developmental grooves to make sure that we have those well-defined and as deep as possible on the occlusal surface. Well-defined and rounded ridges which are basically in between these grooves, and deep pits. These three things, if properly uh, done, uh, will really cause uh, the natural morphology of teeth to really kind of come alive and, and look and function really, really nicely. And then when we look at secondary anatomy, you always want this to be contoured. You know, it's, it's secondary anatomy, not secondary grooves. And I, and I think, you know, I see so often that people just, they call it chicken scratching or hen scratching on the clues of teeth. It, uh, it doesn't look natural. It's um, in terms of, of, of all metal crowns, it can be diff very difficult to polish. <coughs> and for, he for heaven's sakes, no parentheses. You know, when I see this, when I see these concentric, you know, evenly spaced little parentheses on the crucial table. It just, it just, it just makes me crazy, and it's so unnecessary to do this. It's, it's so easy to uh, take a different approach to designing occlusals and and get something that really looks nice and, and and functions nicely. Now, when we look at contacts, it's really, really important. Always need to be adhered to. Um, point contacts on the ridges on the occlusals and balanced. You know, I'm a big believer in tripod contacts. And if you do this, you'll never have unbalanced contacts on inclines, which if we're hitting on one incline, of course, there's going to be a net force trying to move that tooth in the direction of that contact. So it's, um, it, it, it's from an orthodontic point of view, a really, really bad idea to have uh, unbalanced contacts on inclines. So while point contacts are really good, you've got to make sure that they are balanced. And we'll talk more about point contacts later. <laughs> and no eccentric contacts um, or interferences anywhere on the tooth. And of course, this has, is a little bit of function, but it's just basic function that when we move the models around outside of centric and uh, grind them across each other, we don't have anything touching once the, the cusps leave their centric position. And of course, interproximal contacts kind of define themselves. They are contact areas. They are not points. And you want them as broad as possible without violating the rules of shape. So if we have our teeth shaped properly, the contacts are going to kind of be a no-brainer. Okay? And so all these things affect each other. And when we're looking at, at designing shape and contour to get proper morphology in our teeth. 
And uh, I'm a big believer in really robust, nice anatomy. That doesn't mean a lot of scratches. It really means a lot of contouring. And it means just what we talked about, well-defined ridges, point contacts, uh, contoured secondary anatomy. And, you, you know, it's got three major advantages, in my opinion. It looks nice, number one. It's much easier to adjust, number two. And it enhances the efficiency of mastication, which is a topic, I think, that's, that's not addressed enough, okay? Um, I, I think it's really important to understand the teeth are there for function. You know, they're there to chew our food. And so if we can produce them in such a way that they do a better job of that, that, that increases the health of, of the patient. So, yeah, you know, I like nice, robust anatomy, and my doctors like it too. And, and I'm, it, just like if I'm doing a, an anterior tooth and they've got an ugly crown and I'm doing a, a crown next to an ugly crown, I'm not going to make an ugly crown because I want to blend with, with, with something that's ugly that's already there. I'm going to make it nice looking, and maybe they'll get motivated to get the other one done, okay? Same with me as posteriors. I don't, I never mirror the existing occlusion. It's, it's quite often not so great anyway. And, and, and I go for the most nicely designed, efficient, and pretty anatomy that I can accomplish with the amount of room that I have. Now, as far as another advantage of robust anatomy and placing our, our point contacts on ridges, that creates what I call point versus bowl contacts. If we look at a, a really a more typical uh, worn out molar or a poorly designed crown, we get areas of contact that are much larger, like mortars and pestles. Now, when a doctor is needs to adjust this, he's got to grind a really large area to try to affect any change in vertical, to bring it down if it's a high bite. And it takes a lot longer and it's a lot more grinding to do this. Whereas if we design our occlusion with point contacts on ridges, it is by far much easier to adjust. In fact, it's just a couple of hits with a burr without destroying a large area of the crown. And I've got to tell you, doctors really love this too. We're not unique in that we send out critique sheets on all of our cases and try to get some information back from our doctors on, on um, you know, their experience chair side when we deliver a case. And I would say that you know, the average adjusting time that we see is, is certainly less than two minutes, quite often a minute uh, or less. And that's what I want. I want these crowns to go in. I want the doctor to be happy, be really feel good what he's done, and not destroy what I spent a bunch of time doing. That is just really infuriating to me. And, and of course, the third uh, advantage of robust anatomy is enhanced mastication. And, and like I said, I don't think that this is looked at enough in, in, in the world of dentistry and nutrition. It's important to realize that any plant or vegetable is composed of cells. And these cells have a cell wall. And this little packet contains all the good stuff that's in there. It's all inside the cells. And any cells that we don't break open mechanically by chewing, grinding, we don't get any of the nutrition out of that. Zero. And that's, that's exactly why when you eat corn on the cob, the next day it goes through and it looks pretty much like the way it went in. Okay? And that's because the, the outer shell of a corn kernel is also cellulose, just like the cell wall in, in leafy vegetables. And if you don't break it open with your teeth, you're not going to get any goodness out of it at all. And so um, I have an old book by Dr. Victor Lucia called The Modern Nephrological Concepts. It was written in the 50s. It's, it, but these concepts don't change. And even back then, you know, in his book it says the arrangement of marginal transverse and oblique ridges so that they have a shearing action makes um, for a much more efficient chewing apparatus, less force is required to prepare, prepare the food for digestion. And preparing the food for digestion means to break open all the cells. This is why um, we, we want to look at, at, at maybe putting better anatomy in a crown we do than maybe what's in the existing teeth to help with this process. And it's also why juicing is so good, because when we run, run our vegetables through a machine, it breaks open all these cells, and what's in there is all the good stuff from the inside of the cells. It physically breaks open all the cell walls. So we want our teeth to be able to do that as well to get the most out of the foods that we eat. <coughs> Now, of course, if we don't have spot-on occlusion when we make our crowns, so when they go to the mouth, they're not getting destroyed, then it's all, it's all a waste of time. 
Okay, so we need to recognize the things that cause us problems and cause a crowd to go from the model to the mouth and not be the same. And uh, one of the key things to achieving this is to pre-spot or equilibrate your models. Um, that when you're waxing, don't compress your wax on the occlusals. Okay, when you put a big glob of melted wax on top of a die and you close your articulator into it, particularly if the wax has started to cool a little bit, it's a, bit a little bit firmer, you will compress that wax. And what that does is when you invest that and that investment starts to heat up, that compressed wax starts to relax, it expands, and that's why when you make a gold crown, they just look great on the model, you spot that down perfect, you get it back out of the casting, and it's like so high you can't believe it. you're going, what the world? You overcompressed your wax when you were actually modeling that, that crown. So we, we want to avoid that uh, by building our final contacts into occlusion, not carving them out of a big block of something. And I like to adjust my occlusion with a little bit thicker tape, uh, something in the 80 micron range I find works really well. I use the silk. There are other um, uh, tapes out there. Whitman's got a great one. You know, I like the silk because it's big and it covers my whole arch and it's easy to use. A little messy, but nice. Now, when it comes to interproximal contacts, things change a little bit because we do want to compress that wax interproximally. There's nothing worse than getting the crown back out of, out of the pressing of the casting and having the contacts open. We either got to solder it or we got to fire something on a monolithic crown, and uh, it's just not what we want to do. Okay, if we can avoid that. So, and uh, many of my clients like to have a little bit of a of, of a robust contact in order that they can define it and adjust it a little bit and get it just with the the, the, the staff they want in the floss. Uh, I mentioned the Amman gyroform model system for stone models because it's brilliant in that it's more accurate than a solid model, and that's why I'm not mentioning solid models for contacts uh, in this lecture because I don't use solid models. I use this system. And it is definitely as accurate as digital models, which themselves also are very accurate because they don't have the expansion of the stone that we get in stone models. Again, the uh, gyroform model compensates linearly for any of the expansions. So it's, it's awesome if you're not aware of this, worth looking into it uh, for your stone models. Pre-spotting, though, is really the key to this whole thing, and it's nothing more than recognizing that when stone sets, it expands volumetrically, linearly, so our teeth don't fit together the same in models as they do in the mouth. They're all, the, the, the vertical is always higher because the, the, the cusps don't interdigitate anywhere like they do in, in the mouth, so we have to adjust this and equilibrate it down. Again, I like the silk tape. I don't like mylar. It's, uh, the pieces are too small. You can't, you can't see the whole arch. It's, uh, it's, just, it's too thin for the nature of our materials, which are, 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 are not as accurate as, as um, dimensions of the mouth, where mylar is appropriate. There are some rules for this that are very simple. Um, adjust with a sharp cleoid discoid. And, and I was going to go into how to sharpen one of these things, because a lot of people don't know how to do this, but it's important that it be sharp. Um, using a handpiece is dangerous because you will overadjust in a heartbeat. People are tempted to do it because uh, scraping with a cleoid is not as fast, but it is if you sharpen it okay, and keep it sharp. In most cases, you just want to equilibrate until you get a spot on either side of the prep. Okay, the, the, the teeth on either side of the prep, mesial and distal, or the preps, gets good solid contact. If you've got full quadrants, which I mean a full quadrant from central all the way back, at least on one side, you don't equilibrate at all because the bite should uh, set that vertical. A bite material is far more uh, accurate than than um, our stone. So uh, the only tip I'll give you here is use a different color tape than your portion department uses so they can distinguish their marks from the ones that are left on the model uh, when this is done in the model department. Okay, And again, I like uh, silk tape because it covers my whole model. It's easy to use and it's, it, uh, yeah, I get, I get the green from Zon. So uh, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's pretty simple. We tap, tap, and of course, this tooth has nothing on it. Uh, these marks are just ghost marks. From the that's one thing you got to watch out for with silk. It will lay across your cuff tips and leave a light mark, but it's obvious what's a centric mark and what's a ghost mark. And so we just equilibrate with it with a sharp, uh, clear discoid, uh, tapping in between until we see these contact points. Then we got good solid contact on either side of our prep, and of course. Always take a look, <laughs> because sometimes, especially with plastic articulators, 
we will be moving these things a little bit out of centric, not realizing it will be a little bit in a lateral movement. We'll tap, tap. Oh, I see this mark. And when it kind of slides back into true centric, it's really not down. So always make sure that your, your articulator is in a, in a neutral position and that you close uh, carefully and just visually verify that you definitely see that contact, okay? Because you will miss this, believe me, sometimes. Now, <clears throat> Now I want to get into uh, the tools I use, the techniques I use for designing and creating posterior morphology or, or, or occlusal surfaces. And I use basically two carvers. I use a Union Broach REC carver, which has a, a little curved carver. I wanted a big spear on the other. I don't use that spear. And I use the Blue Dolphin WC1 instrument it, it, uh, that you can buy pretty much anywhere. Um, this is, um, um, gosh, I'm not sure. I got this one from Sun. Item number 105-101. This tool is indispensable. And I use them for very specific things, okay? My little carver is concave on one side, which I use for carving convex surfaces, outer surfaces. It's convex on the other side, which I use for carving concave surfaces. And... Um, uh, like outer contours and the inclined planes on, on, on the concave side and for lobes and interproximal concavities uh, on the convex side. And then my little blue dolphin, I use the sharp little Holland back end for occlusal grooves and pits pretty much only. And then the, the cleoid kind of end or the scraper kind of end for contouring my secondary anatomy pretty much exclusively on the occlusal surface. Now, um, you know, th this is not a promo for Whitmix, but you know, I will say I, I really like a lot of their equipment. Um, their dip pods kind of cool because you can have three different temperatures and three different wells. I like the hot shot or the hot spot, the little um, induction heating. We don't I use, don't use flames anymore, but I just want you know I just want to point out this Redford Geo Dip. This, you know, I, I've been on a quest for a decent dipping wax forever. And I discovered this stuff. I got a sample of it in the mail years ago. And I, and I stuck it in my wax pot and I melted it. And it was kind of soft and kind of greasy. And, and, and when I first tried it, I said, God, I don't know about this stuff. It's kind of weird. And then as I used it, I realized this stuff is just brilliant. It, I never have to reseal a margin. Nothing, no, no margins ever open up or distort when I'm investing. I, you know, it, it has saved me so much time. And it's so predictable and so accurate. This product I'll plug, you know, even though, unfortunately, it's not a Whitmix product, and they do have good dip wax, this stuff, I think, is really great. But my workhorse is this baby, this dual-handle waxer, and, and it is a Whitmix product, and, and I don't use it because it is. I use it because it's the best. And with the two sides, I, I use one side with this tip that's got this funny little, it's like a funny little three-dimensional S-curve on the tip. And I've never seen anything like this. And I don't know who came up with this, but it's, it's fabulous. And the little elbow of it here you, picks up a lot of wax, which goes right to the tip, and it goes right where you want it. It's just it's amazing. And I use this at a temperature of 225 Fahrenheit for general waxing and smoothing and adding cuss tips and do, doing more like bulk smoothing kind of stuff. The other tip, I leave at 160, and it's just a small little pointed tip, a little curve, curve pointed tip, lose a little morphology and anatomy. And, and while this um, waxer has, does have a touch feature on each handle that allows you to have two different temperatures set, that doesn't work well for me because if I want to go to a higher temperature, I've got to wait for it to get there. And if I want to drop back from a higher temperature, I've got to wait for it to get there. I don't want that. I like to pick up the handle, and I don't, I, I don't need more than two temperatures. And I want them right there when I want them, and this is, this is perfect for that. I, of course, use occlusal molds to, 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 to do the bulk waxing. These are braided molds. Uh, um, doesn't matter to me which ones you use. There's just a couple rules for how to best utilize these things. Um, it's a quick way to get a basic shape. I am not interested in the morphology that they provide. Okay, and I'll explain why uh, later. Um, it's similar to a library for digital design. It's a starting point. Okay, and then we refine it from there. And I don't usually use these in thin situations because I'm squishing the wax too much to get really thin, and I compress it too much, and it's just I, I find it actually doesn't save me any time to use it in super thin like gold crown situations. Of course, lubing and dipping a dye is pretty self-explanatory. 
um, filling a mold is pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> But you know, when you do this, you know, you want to apply it as soon as you can while it's still kind of shiny and the wax is 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 uh, still as melted as possible. To turn it upside down and close it all the way into occlusion. And I know this is different than what uh, probably most people kind of think you're supposed to do. But again, what I want is not to have my initial wax up even in occlusion if I can avoid it. I certainly want to compress it as little as I can. Um, and so once I've accomplished this, I just fill in my axial surfaces and do my contacts quickly, um, put a little melted wax on each proximal surface, re-index it into the model, and just get the full mesial distal width of the, of the crown quickly as I can. Okay, I'm not interested in these things being perfect at this point, just close. So now what I've got is a basic form. It's kind of there, and I'm ready to start. Okay, the key points again when you're using this mold is you know apply it as soon as you can again to avoid compression. So so any excess wax escapes easily. It minimizes that compression, which is expansion when we invest and an investment heats up. Close into the opposing into centric, and that minimizes your occlusal contact you have to deal with initially, which is what I want to do. So <laughs> so bulk waxing, filling in the axial surfaces. And is done pretty much with the molds, and so really where we want we want to go is just smoothing and completing our outside contours, removing any occlusal contacts, decompressing our wax, and completing our occlusal. So really, once we use our molds, we've got three basic steps left to complete um, the occlusal of our crowns or complete uh, the rest of our crowns. So at this point that we've got our mold, we're ready to begin. Now, uh, this is just my approach to this. First thing I do is just rough in my outside contours. I look at my, at my speed curve. I, if this is an upper, I'll bring up my buckle, buckle cuss tips. If it's a lower, I'll bring up my lingual cuss tips. You know, again, looking at Wilson and speed curves to get these things correct. And uh, I'll check my buckle cusp length or my lingual cusp length. If it's a lower, make sure I'm okay. I'll go into a lateral movement and make sure nothing's touching. This is maybe a little bit long on the mesial buckle cusp, but you know we're getting there. Um, and and I want to make sure I remove any occlusion before I start getting any kind of centric contacts on this crown. So I'll mark this. If I see anything, I want to remove it, get rid of it, get rid of any compressed wax. Then I will go for establishing my, my, my centric contacts on my lingual cuss tip, uh, if it's an upper, or my buckle cuss tip on a lower, and flow wax until I see those contacts come into place. Just quick and rough, nothing fancy about this. Now, what would happen if you did not remove your occlusal contacts first? You'd probably be high, and when you do your centric holding cusps and wax them into occlusion, they'd be, they, they, they would be, <clears throat> again, too high. Your vertical would be open, and you'd be doing additional carving on this later, or you'd have a high cusp you didn't realize. So that's one reason why I remove occlusal contacts first before I do anything, really, on the occlusal table. Now I just smooth out. I go around and quickly smooth out uh, any transitions between the wax I added and the existing surfaces. Kind of get it, you know, uh, looking pretty good. There's my my contact on my center holding cusp, and then I start to refine my axial contours. I don't want to do this until I've really pretty much got the occlusal fairly done. My buckle little cusp tips the right length, pretty much where they go, because then I'm going to get the wrong contour on my on my outer surfaces if those aren't pretty close, and I'm wasting my time. So I'm going to establish my heights of contour. And again, I use the concave side of my carver, and I carve on either side of the heights of contour. I'll carve down near the cervical in one plane, and then in the buckle half in the other, and kind of leave that wax that's going to form my contour basically untouched. So I keep the height of contour. And while I'm there, I'll start developing my developmental groove formation. You know, I'll just, I'll just I'll do my cusp separation on the outer surfaces. Same on the lingual, get it roughed in. I like to use the concave part of my carver because it, it, it leaves a nice convex surface, nice rounded surface. And of course, on the lingual, one of the developmental grooves is between the, the mesial buckle and uh, mesial lingual and, and distal lingual cusps. And I'll go ahead and, and uh, form that. So I want my basic uh, developmental grooves intact, my basic cusp link things done, and then look at everything. 
And I look at this and right away it's obvious that the, 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 the line of these cusps is not in the right place. It's not lined up with the teeth on either side. And my buccal embrasures are too big. They're deficient. This crown is too far lingual. And so before I go any farther, I want to make sure that everything's good. So I'm just going to bulk these up, add a little ridge down the facial. I probably should have done this before I did my outer contours because now I'm going to have to go back and touch those up. Okay, so <laughs> I pointed this out because I would have, you know, I prefer to make sure I get all this right before I do my outer contours. I want, want all this, the occlusal aspect of this crown to be really pretty much right where it needs to be at that time. So I've got to, you know, refine these buckle cusp tips a little bit on the lingual side since I moved them out. So completing my cusp and contours, I've got to go back and redo my development of rule on the buckle cusp now because I didn't catch that little thing later. Then I check it all out, and yep, I'm there. My contours look good. Everything lines up good. My heights of contour are good. I'm good. My outer, my outer shape and size is good, and I'm ready to do my occlusal. And I go into movements, verify my length. I, I like the way this looks. So my, over, my overbite's good. It looks slimmer to the other teeth. Good. So again, I'm going to double check about my occlusal contacts, and if I see much of anything, I'm going to eliminate it. I see nothing other than the centric cusp contacts that I had uh, when I established that a little while ago. But I'm going to remove everything because I kind of want to start fresh. Now, now I will leave my centric cusp, my lingual cusp, maybe barely in contact. But if those are high, and then I start to do my occlusion, it's going to be high. So you really want to be careful not to leave anything in high occlusion at this point before we start our occlusal morphology. <coughs> my first step is to just look in there, open the model slightly, and look to see where uh, are my contacts going to be. And they're going to be there, marginal ridge, somewhere in the center, centric stamp cusp there, marginal ridge there. And maybe some here in the middle of this tooth here, maybe this little distal buckle cusp is going to contact. I don't know. It's kind of short. It might mess up my morphology to try to get that in the kind of, but maybe. So, you know, um, I'll do this as a training exercise. I don't really do it. You know, just mark where I think these are going to be so I know where I'm going with my morphology. I'm go i got to get to these points with my morphology. So, again, this is when I use my waxer at the 160, and I want to build into occlusion my ridges. Okay, There's no way to carve them like this. You can't get the nice rounded look. And you can't get the natural form by carving. You just, you just can't. And so I just quickly add three little lobes or little ridges on my occlusal table, close my articulator, establish that's those centric contacts, take a look. I can see them in there. Um, I continue with my marginal ridges. You can see I already did the mesial marginal ridge. You know, I don't really want to go painstakingly step by step. But the, and here I'm looking to see, can I get that little distal buckle cusp on that lower? I put a little ridge here and see if it will come into contact. And uh, it, it really didn't. You know, I'll, I'll throw a little excessive uh, extraneous uh, morphology maybe here and here and back here and kind of get this occlusal sort of roughed out all done really quickly uh, by flowing wax at a fairly low temperature so it'll stay right where I put it. 160 Fahrenheit works really well with this wax that I'm using. And <clears throat> this is when I just simply contour my secondary anatomy. Everything I want's there. I just kind of want to enhance it and refine it. And I just go through either with the instrument turned sideways if, and if I want to make a little more of a groove looking thing or turn uh, perpendicular to my group if I want to make a hollow or make more of, a, a, of an opened up area. So depending on what I want to do, I'll turn that instrument 90 degrees, that little carver. I'll use this hollow back in to define my, my primary anatomy down through my central fossa, carve my little pits and fissures in here, kind of drag it through and create a roughed out occlusal surface. And, you know, of course, I'm checking with my tape. I've got occlusion like this. Looks pretty good. I've got my centric stamp cusps here and here. I've got my centric holds here and here, my marginal ridge, a uh, little marginal ridge contact in this area. <laughs> and I like it, but those contacts are too broad. I want point contacts. So I'm going to use my little carver again on my Blue Dolphin instrument to skinny these things down into contact points. 
so that I end up, so I'll just create a little more hollow in here, a little more hollow in there, a little something around these points of contact in order to get them down more like points and less, less like areas. And then the final thing I want to do is compress my possible contacts. And, and again, this is where I like um, pinned models. I, I find it's much easier because I can throw some wax on my tooth. I can uh, put the two dies in on one side where they're not seated yet, and then when I push them down, they come together, it compresses that wax in approximately. And the trick to this is the timing. You want your, the wax you float on to not be shiny, to be just soft enough to conform, but not so soft that it tears, or you get, you get scratches or scrapes along that contact. You want it to press the contact. That's why I do the two dies at the same time. And then the other side, same exact procedure, and we establish our contacts. And then now it's just a matter of opening up my interproximal areas, some proximal tissue, my concavity. And this is key here, you know, that we carry this concavity from the proximal up onto the buccal surface, swinging this instrument around at a 90 degree arc to define that little lobe, that little tennis ball I talked about, where the teeth touch each other and where my inclusal abrasions are going to be, interproximal abrasions are going to be, and you start to create that lobe form. So I want a little robustness here, a little robustness here, a little concavity in between. Okay, and this is really simple. Again, remember, we want our little tennis ball in there. We want our little ball, a little rounded. And, and if you pay a little attention to this, it's amazing how much nicer your crowns look, how much more functional they are, how, how you don't want anything square on, on a tooth. Everything is rounded and lobed. It's the way they form. And now we just expose our margins, okay, um, around the crown. Again, you know, making sure that I have that concavity in the interproximals. Um, double check my heights of contour. I just want to make sure that I, you know, w when you're carving, when you want to leave a height of contour, carve on either side of it, okay, parallel to it. Same thing up the buccal cusps. When I want to leave that height of contour, that ridge down from occlusal to gingival, I carve on either side of it. And so, you know, my idea is to not remove my heights of contour, to leave them intact. So we inspect, it looks good. I got a height of contour down here at the gingival, down here on the gingival, mesial and distally, and then my occlusal looks like this. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, really, it doesn't take nearly as long as it took me to tell you how, to, how, I, how I do this. Um, I wanted to look particularly at limited space because I think this is the place where people blow it when they're designing their morphology and, and they make it look flat and ugly and, and, they, and they make bowl contacts. And it's unnecessary. You know, just because you have tight occlusion doesn't mean you can't use these same techniques um, uh, for designing morphology. And, and again, I don't use molds here. I'll just fill in the interproximal so my wax doesn't flow through there. And then just glob some wax on and close into it. <laughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> and you know, basically do the same thing uh, that we did before, but I, I don't start with a mold. I'll remove that obvious excess wax, carve it back, um, finish my outer contours, get my cuss tips in the right place, get my bulk right, get my highest contour right, get my outer contour established just like before. Okay. Take a look at it. They're complete. My heights of contour look good. I like my lingual cusp length. You know, I've established my, you know, I, 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 I cut to the chase here a little bit. Established my, uh, my, my, my uh, centric cusps. I'm going to check my occlusion and get rid of it, okay, in a little bit. Um, at this point, I carve my inclined planes. I want some wax to work with. And remember, this is where you should always start when you're carving occlusal, carving your inclined planes. And I use these contact points to sort of guide me. I know where I'm going to have contact, so I kind of know where. It gives me a guide. So I'm going to want to end up a little something in here. This is a good tripod center to hold here. Buckle cusp contacts, marginal ridge contacts, following uh, the idea of these inclined planes. This one's pretty close to the, to, to the drawing I have here. And then I remove my occlusion. I know I've got my basic ridge shape, developmental grooves, kind of where they need to be. Remove my occlusion. Um, at this point, kind of define my primary anatomy around these features that I've already got on my occlusal, around the rough ridges, um, and just boom, there we go. Now what I want to do is just go back and add in my occlusion. 
And so I'm going to take my low temperature instrument, my 160, and just, I know where I want to go, I'm just going to add it in. And so to cut to the chase, I float in this ridge, something here, something there, something there. I just kind of went around this thing and, and float on a couple little ridges. What I defined was a real quick, uh, morphological plan of where I want to go, knowing what, what my goal is on this. And then I get my cool little carver using my, my silk tape. I see my occlusion and I'm going to start to refine it down to the perfect uh, amount of contact. And I'm really just following the grooves that, and, and the form that I have from my, from my initial flowing of these ridges. And again, using the edge of the carver when I want to make more of a groove, the flat end when I want to make more of a concavity, I definitely want to make sure that I get my pits and my fishes established. And in no time at all, it looks like this. And this is on a fairly thin crown. I mean, I know I'm at about 0.5 because I can see the green wax here coming through. Okay, this is about where I am there. A little more here. We have a little more room there uh, to work with. But I'm, I'm down to green right there in that pit. And you can see from where we started to where we got, it really hasn't changed much. These basic features are here. They're just smoothed out, and I've done some concavities, and I've done some depths, and, I made, you know, and, and really not much in the way of grooves. My only grooves are my primary developmental grooves, not so much secondary. Those are contours. And now I want to skinny down these contacts. I don't want such broad areas. You know, so I'm going to hollow out. I'm going, to, I'm going to take away some where I don't need it and leaving behind only that little bit of contact that I'm looking for. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk much about function and occlusion, which I'm not, but come on. Interferences, you know, we put our tape on, we move through our things. Here's a working interference on this, uh, on this here. And I want to get rid of it. So I've got to carve out this little concavity in here to get rid of that uh, interference. And so, again, just where we started quickly, where we ended, uh, I did take some of this out in here because of the interference, skinned these down to little contacts, there we go. And then this is what we get when we finally polish this crown. And so this was an easy crown to polish because I had contours, not scratches. I had things in the right places. I had nice ridge formation. I had good, good uh, point contacts. Um, I've got my lobes on the outer surface. Um, this is going to be a really nice functional crown in the mouth. It's going to look good, a lot better than this. And yet we had very little space to do this. It was really, really easy to do just with a basic approach. And, and now, you know, I see we're getting short on time. I want to look at some things about a few different teeth that, that, that I see where people make mistakes quite often and just highlight these a little bit. Lower first molars are one in particular because that distal buckle cusp should not be prominent from the buckle. You don't want to see these three perfect e equal cusps here if possible. Now sometimes occlusion is such that you can't avoid it, but you really can a lot. Because that distal buckle cusp <laughs> should be invisible from, the, from looking at from the front, and it really is not part of the buckle surface. It's really part of the distal triangular fossa. And so if we design it this way, when we cover our triangular fossa, just bring this groove on out, that defines this little distal buckle cusp. Um, some of the variations of the lower that I run into from time to time, um, I just want to show a couple things that, that pop up and, and I, some of my work actually make mistakes on. When we see something like this, you, know, you never want to try to establish a centric cusp that violates the rules of arch form cusp length, curves of Spee and Wilson, those kinds of things just to get an extra contact. You, just, you wouldn't want to put a long cusp up in an area. And a lot of times we'll see it uh, you know, between the distal aspects of opposing molars. Uh, they, they curve away from each other and we, we don't want to try to engage those. We want to maintain our, our, our proper morphology. This situation here where this is almost tooth to tooth occlusion between this upper, these teeth are a little small for uh, upper molars. Usually the first molar is bigger than the second, same on the lower. Um, and so we've got a situation here that's defining a different developmental groove placement than what is considered ideal because of the placement of this tooth. Unlike a more ideal situation where this is actually tooth to two tooth occlusion, where one tooth touches two teeth, and this distal buccal cusp of the upper is usually distal to the uh, contacts on the lower second molar. 
So in this case, we start looking at where these cusp tips are going to be. They're defining three cusps as well on the lower. And I will do that. I mean, you know, some people say, no, nope, that's violating the rules. Well, okay, you know, that's, that's a personal thing. But this case here, I made two first molars because of the nature of the function. I think this is going to, this is going to uh, function more efficiently. It's going to give me waste gates because one thing you want with these deep developmental grooves is when a person does chew, the food has a place to squish out. They're called waste gates, has a place to go. And that aids in the efficiency of mastication. So this maybe functionally is a little better. Now, probably the biggest mistake I see all the time is lower bicuspids. Okay, they are very unique teeth in the in in, in, in the, they they don't they don't uh, conform to the rules that other teeth tend to follow. Okay, the lower first bicuspid is a transition from a cuspid. It is more cuspid-like than it is molar-like. It's really not a true posterior tooth. It's not a true anterior tooth. It is a very unique tooth. Now. The, the lower second bicuspid actually is a transitional tooth to a molar. It transitions to a molar. And so we want to think in terms of cuspid when we're making the lower first bicuspid. We want to think in terms of molar when we're making the lower second bicuspid. This is not true on the upper. On the upper, those two bicuspids, I haven't even talked about them because they're such straightforward, simple teeth, okay? And they're, they're virtually interchangeable. They're almost identical. In, in, in their form morphology. But the common mistake on, on lower first bicuspids is the lingual cusp too high. <laughs> and it's not enough cuspid like. If we look at the contralateral arch on this one, you can see it's really a slope down. It's like a cuspid with a couple, with a, with a little cusp or two bumped here on the lingual. An enhanced cingulum basically is what it is. And it's almost always lower and more inclined than the second bicuspid. And so we want, we want to try to mimic that to the best of our ability when we carve. But usually they're not prepped properly for this, doctors. I don't know. They don't, they don't see it. They think they're getting too close. I don't know. But, but typically we have a hard time doing this because of the preps. But you do the best you can to try to, to, try to transition from a cuspid through this tooth towards a molar to a molar. It's a continual transition through these teeth. So rather than this, we prefer to do a little something like this, which is not a big change, but it's enough to really uh, lend much more of a natural look and feel to these teeth. Okay, and then when we finally get them, they, you know, they, they conform more nicely. This, of course, is more trapezoid, and this is more square, leading to bigger lingual embrasures than buccal embrasures. Everything's rounded and flows in really nicely, exactly what we want when we uh, make our crowns. Okay, so. Um, when I look at the kinds of things that that that, that I see in general uh, on teeth, it's it's improper occlusal embrasure form, not concave enough interproximal, the tissue impingement, uh, occlusal tables too wide on lower molars, lingual cusp on lower molars too long, in violation of the Wilson, and upper lingual cusp incorrect. Okay, these are the the things that I see over and over and over again when I look at people's. Um, wax ups in their morphology. So, you know, th I took this from, from, from a girl I was training and she goes, hey, what do you think? I said, hey, not bad, but you know we got a problem in your embrasure form in here. This is just not round enough and it's common because this is a bad crown that's very square in this area and I'd much rather see this rounded and maybe see that rounded down a hair. I'm a big believer in nice rounded embrasure form. Interproximal tissue impingement is a big, big one. Again, contacts too long, not enough space in here, and they need to be concaved out, again, so that we can make some breathing room for our tissue. I see this really, really commonly on bicuspids on the interprods where they're just not opened up enough, uh, more like, like the natural teeth are, and it's just a simple matter of taking out a little bit of space and making a little S-curve in this area. Very common mistake when carving because we, we, we want to see this kind of a morphology when we're done with our with our posterior teeth and make sure we've got plenty of room in here for our interproximal tissue and our nice lobes in these areas where our teeth touch and, and produce our embrasures. And again, you know, this all goes back to how to contour, but I see so often the lingual cusps of the upper are not rolled in enough and so that makes the occlusal table too wide. And we want to always roll in our lingual cusps so that the, the cusp tip is actually inside the how to contour. And we actually see this area on the lower molar. And again, that's a function of our, of our height of contour. If we've got our height of contour right, this is going to be right. These things all 
work together to form um, properly designed teeth. And the upper first molar lingual cusp is another area that is almost always misdesigned. Th this tooth, this ridge, this, this mesolingual cusp is actually a continuous ridge from the, from the mesial buckle all the way around to the transverse ridge on this distal buccal cusp. It's a continuous curve. And there's always a little wall here, a little height, a drop off down to this developmental groove. Okay, there, there's a vertical drop right here. And this cusp is almost like stuck on uh, as an afterthought. And it actually is. This tooth forms embryologically as more of a, of a tricuspid tooth. And then this lobe uh, forms on this initial tooth bud. And so, and so we want to kind of look at that when we design these things. So when I'm flowing my linguals and I'm starting to do my carving, that's why I carve this developmental groove always on the distal buccal cusp to create that vertical wall and this slope down to that developmental groove. And that helps me define this continuous ridge all the way around to, from this distal buccal cusp around through to the mesial and gives me a much more appropriate and natural looking contour on the, on the uh, upper molar teeth. Now, um, oh, good, we, we're almost um, done here. This is just to show a, a, a few um, crowns, finished results of things we did. These are all myelithic Emax crowns um, showing, you know, and also when you have the nice pit formation, you take the time to do this, it makes a little bit of subtle staining kind of easy, nice, no big deal. They, the, the stain just aggregates there and it makes for a nice subtle uh, chroma change on the occlusal surface. We, you know, we do want to concern ourselves with surface texture, although we're not really talking about that so much on, uh, on this lecture. We're really talking about morphology as far as form and shape go, but that, that's another aspect that's very, very important. And again, you know, notice there are very few actual secondary grooves. As a matter of fact, basically none. Um, developmental grooves, yes. Pits and fissures, yes. But everything else is contours. <laughs> Excuse me. And we always want to make sure that we have our balanced occlusion. Even though I'm not going to have a contact back in here, I've got my tripod uh, mostly point. I would, you know, seeing this, maybe skinning this down a hair. Got my centric holding cusps, my light point contacts in my, my tripod uh, centric here on the occlusal table. And this will be a really nice, stable, well-functioning, well-chewing crown. And I had a, a doctor, she, this is like pulling teeth <laughs> to, to get them to send me pictures, but I said, hey, just send me, do, do tap tap and send me some pictures. I just want to see what kind of occlusion I'm actually getting in the mouth. And, and it's not too bad, a little, a little hot spot there, not quite sure. These, these I think, may be ghosty things um, back on the lingual. But hey, look, I'm getting there. By the time he brings this down, hopefully these would come in. Um, I asked for it at the point of insert rather than after he was done, so it's what I got. A little heavy here, a little heavy here, but this crown is not too bad. Just got a little bit of light contact starting to come in. It's what I want. You don't want your crowns out of occlusion. This is not a solution to high occlusion. Trust me. Okay. And of course, I got this picture with nothing, so it's pretty much nothing. But you know, he sent it, so I'm showing it. He took the time to do it. But again, you know, we really want to concentrate on contouring secondary anatomy, not so much carving it. Um, development of groove formation. Uh, proper mesolingual cusp formation on the uppers and and the like. And then this I want to get into real quick just because it's one of the biggest things for me in my lab is is getting warp free bridges. And I'm not going to get into doing connections, okay? Everybody's got a theory. I've seen it from tying them down with dental floss to just connecting them with soft red rope wax to using glue to to you name it, okay? I personally, we actually glue our final connections, okay, with uh, CA glue, and, and that's a whole other technique. What I want to get into is the crux of warp-free bridges, which really uh, goes down to the main problem of investing in casting, which is the fact that investment expands volumetrically and linearly, both, okay? So the volumetric is good because we need that to compensate for the shrinkage of the metal after it's cast because uh, otherwise our, our visual copings, the individual copings don't fit, okay? <laughs> That's important. But the linear expansion is the kiss of death because when we expand these, especially around a corner, 
it makes the bridge too long, okay? And and just remember that because our abutments are locked, we've got a vessel on the inside, this linear expansion doesn't shrink back to the original size. We're stuck with it in our, in our final bridge. And so this slightly increases the distance between units. It, it causes a distortion, which can be a torsion around corners. And this, in my opinion, is the main reason why we get warped bridges. Why the longer they get, the worse they get. But trust me, even three unit bridges can be tough. The solution is actually pretty simple. You want to keep the volumetric expansion, and you want to limit the linear expansion. Okay, and the way we do that is by investing with two different mixes of investment, with two different expansions. Uh, we use normal expansion for abutments, which is 63% liquid for this particular alloy, and we use a reduced expansion at 20%, 15 to 20% for filling the ring. And we have two mixers. Uh, that's the easiest way to do this. Okay, and it can be done with one, but 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 timing is really kind of tricky for this with one mixer, but here's what we do. We tear the, the bowl for the, the low expansion, the most of the investment like this. We put a plaster bowl on top, put our main mixing bowl here, and tear the, the machine, tear the scale with this. And we're going to use this mix to fill the ring. So I'll dump the amount of powder I need, which is 160 grams for uh, this particular ring. These are 100 gram packets, so it's about one and two thirds of a packet. Uh, I, I try to get my 160. Then when I dispense the liquid, it goes into this bowl. And I can set this aside. Okay, and remember, this is 20%. This is low expansion. This is what we're going to fill the ring with. Then I take the balance of the investment that I got from that packet, because I don't want to open a new packet. So I only need like 10 or 15, 20 grams for this. And I'm going to mix this at the normal uh, ratio for the proper expansion for the abutments, for the copings. And <clears throat> mix this up. And I start that one on the mixer and then immediately go stick the, the high expansion on the, on the other mixer because I want this to finish a little bit first. <laughs> now, if you only have one machine, you can do this, okay? And the way you do this is you mix your normal expansion for only about 30 seconds first, okay? And then remove it and immediately jump in the liquid and start your, your, your low expansion mix on the same machine. While that's mixing, for about a minute, you hand mix your, your, your first mix, your, your normal expansion mix with your hand for another 15 or 20 seconds because 30 seconds isn't quite enough. So while your second mix is going, which is what you're going to fill your ring with, you continue to hand mix the small amount for your abutments a little bit more. Okay? Timing's tricky, and if you, miss, if you mess this up and, and the investment that you're going, you're going to put into your copings starts to set and warm up before you fill the ring, it will distort your margins. You know? So I, I think it's best done with two machines, but it's simple. You fill your copings with your, uh, your normal expansion mix. You fill the ring with a low expansion mix, so you eliminate the linear expansion of your bridge, and I'm telling you, we're seeing this on everything we do, okay, um, we're seeing this kind of fit almost 100%. Occasionally, and it baffles me, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. We'll see, we'll see a little discrepancy somewhere, but nothing we haven't been able to fix by just using uh, a laser welder or a phaser welder in a, in a contact to, to move this a little bit without actually having to, um, to cut and ever solder. And this technique really works. And then the last thing I want to show you guys, and I threw this in, is fast cooling Emacs. Now, if you're like me in a small lab, this is infuriating. You get used to, we want to get this moving. And so, believe me, <laughs> I just had this idea. I take a little fan and a little rotating model display stand that I get at Amazon, about two feet apart, these things, and, and cool it. And, and I turn the fan on, put the ring on there, and this thing rotates so we get even cooling. It's not cool on one side and hot on the other. I've been doing this for years. I've, I've had no issues. I've never seen any kind of a crack or anything. And this makes them crazy. It even they just freak they go freaking crazy. And and but anyway, I, I just had to throw this out because it freaking works, man. It cools them really quick. And uh, anyway, I apologize. I ran over. I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, I really uh, when I practiced it, it was perfect. And uh, that's it. So I hope you got something you can use. Uh, you will receive an email on, on and a little quiz. Which you know, trust me, if you were here, you're gonna get a hundred. And, and uh, hopefully you walked away with some ideas uh, to help you maybe um, get some better results of what you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Al. Um, at this time, I would like it 
to open it up for some questions. So if you do have any, please go ahead and write them in the questions box. Um, as you're doing that, as Al said, um, there is a CE test if you would like the CE credit. And you will be receiving an um, and we'll also, we've also recorded the webinar, so you can watch it at a later time. I will include a link to the webinar in the email I send out as well. Um, Al, it looks like no questions have come up so far, so since we're over um, our time limit, I think we're going to go ahead and um, end the webinar. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to email us at webinar at .com and we will answer those questions for you. Um, again, thank you for attending today, and we look forward to having you back on another webinar. Thank you, and have a great day.